Well, hello and welcome to Musings of a Texas Preacher Man. I'm Scott Fisher and I'm glad you've chosen to study with me today. We're continuing our study of the new heavens and new earth and yesterday we got to the primary text in Isaiah chapter 65 that introduces this concept of God creating a new heavens and a new earth. Now there are only five verses in the entire Bible that specifically address these words, the new heavens and a new earth with the first mention in Isaiah 65, verse 17. Today we're going to look at all five instances, and then we'll come back and examine each one in depth. First, we have Isaiah 65, verse 17, which we looked at yesterday. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things will not be remembered or come to mind. Second, we have Isaiah 66, verse 22. For just as the new heavens and the new earth which I make will endure before me, declares the Lord, so your offspring and your name will endure. Third is 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, which was our primary text verse uh, for the entire study. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. Fourth is 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And then finally, number five, Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there's no longer any sea. Now, as I've said, I contend that Peter's prophecy of New heavens and new earth is not about a cataclysmic end of the world as we know it, yet to happen at some point in our future, but instead was a prophecy of the 70 AD destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, bringing to a cataclysmic end the old covenant Judaistic system. Now one of the arguments of the futurists is that this new heavens and new earth is yet in our future, and it represents what they call the eternal state or uh, the literal messianic kingdom. They attach all kinds of things to it from different scriptures, and it's, it's presented as a catch-all for the literal fulfillment of prophecies used to describe what Jesus called the kingdom of the heavens or the kingdom of God. I describe their view as looking toward a planetary utopia. No sin, no war, no sickness, no disease, no death. Carnivorous animals become vegetarians. Poisonous snakes are no longer poisonous. Now, you don't get any of that from the five verses that mention the new heavens and new earth. For example, Isaiah chapter 2, which obviously immediately follows Isaiah chapter 1, and Isaiah chapter 1 is a prophecy of the destruction of the apostates of Israel. We come to Isaiah chapter 2, and verses 2 through 4 describes the messianic kingdom in the following way, beginning at verse 2. Now it will come about that in the last days the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains and will be raised above the hills and the nations will stream to it. And many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways and that we may walk in his ways. For the law will go forth from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he will judge between the nations, and will render decisions for many peoples, and they will hammer their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and never again will they learn war. So think through this process. Isaiah 1 is a prophetic word against the apostates of Israel and foretells a coming destruction. Isaiah chapter 2 is what immediately follows and prophesies what will come about, quote, in the last days. Now here's a question you have to ask. The last days of what? Following the prophesied destruction of Jerusalem in the temple, which was to take place in the last days, would come this messianic kingdom. It's the last days of the apostates of Israel. It's the last days of Old Covenant Judaism. 
quote, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains and all the nations will string to it. This is the kingdom of the heavens. This is the kingdom of God, the messianic kingdom introduced by Jesus, the promised Messiah of Israel. It's the new covenant. The nations will stream to it. This is the coming to faith of Gentiles and the makeup of the kingdom being comprised of every nation, every tribe, and every tongue. No longer the single, literal, physical bloodline of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Isaiah 2 concludes with the following apocalyptic statement, starting at verse 17. The pride of man will be humbled, and the loftiness of men will be abased, and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. But the idols will completely vanish. Men will go into caves of the rocks and into holes of the ground before the terror and the splendor of his majesty when he arises to make the earth tremble. In that day, men will cast away to the moles and the bats their idols of silver and their idols of gold, which they made for themselves to worship in order to go into the caverns of the rocks and the clefts of the cliffs before the terror of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty when he arises to make the earth tremble. Stop regarding man whose breath of life is in his nostrils, for why should he be esteemed? Now this is one of the verses that Jesus mentioned when he spoke to the women we looked at yesterday who were weeping for him as he is pushed toward the crucifixion on the Via Dolorosa. And he said to them, stop weeping for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. Now clearly, Jesus placed Isaiah 1 and 2 in the lifetime of the first century Jews who crucified him. Now one other important point from this passage, verse 17, the pride of man will be humbled and the loftiness of men will be abased and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. Now here's a concept that's critical to understand. And it's found throughout Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. The Lord is exalted in judgment. Now that goes against the grain for most contemporary evangelical Christians. And so I'll just challenge it. Check it out. Over 80 times in just the book of Ezekiel, that phrase or something very similar to it is stated. And then Jesus makes a very similar statement concerning himself in John chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son. Now look at this. So that all will honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Now, Jesus is saying that in the same way that the Father was honored and exalted in judgment in the writings of the prophets, the Father now has handed judgment to the Son that the Son may be exalted in judgment. And the judgment he was going to be exalted in was the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. Now, folks, listen, until you can wrap your thinking around this concept, nothing in what I'm saying is going to make sense to you. Now, let's go back to Isaiah chapter 65, and we'll pick it up at verse 17 and go through verse 19. For behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth, and the former things will not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem for rejoicing and her people for gladness. I will also rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. And there will no longer be heard in her the voice of weeping and the sound of crying. Now remember, at the time Isaiah was written, Jerusalem had already existed for over 200 years. Yet here we read, that, quote, behold, I create Jerusalem for rejoicing and her people for gladness. This is the new Jerusalem. This is the Jerusalem of Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22 to 24. 
verse 20, 22, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, and to the general assembly, the and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of righteous made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. The new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, Mount Zion, the new covenant, the new heavens and new earth. These are all terms describing the same thing. Well, I hope you're tracking with me and working through the issues we're, we're discussing and, and wrestling with the scriptures. We're going to pick up right here tomorrow and explore this phrase, quote, the voice of gladness and also the voice of weeping and the sound of crying. On the closing screen of the video, you'll see my email address, my Twitter handle, my Facebook page. Feel free to communicate with me. Ask questions. What are you struggling with that you've heard from me? Let's interact. Tomorrow we'll pick up right here and continue looking at the new heavens and the new earth and how it unfolds in the scriptures. So I invite you to stick with me. I know that if you've never considered what I'm sharing with you, it may be shocking. It's a lot to chew on. I get it. I know. I've struggled with it myself. Carefully study the scriptures and allow scripture to interpret scripture. We're going to continue searching out the truth. If you haven't looked at the previous videos, understand this series builds on the previous lessons, so be sure to check them out. If you're willing to study, if you're willing to ask questions, if your desire is to know the truth, to learn what the Bible actually says, then I invite you to join me right here on Musings of a Texas Preacher Man. I post a teaching four times each week on Monday through Thursday. I'll post a link on Facebook and Twitter. And if you click the subscribe button in the lower right corner of your screen, you'll be notified whenever I post a new video. Well, I hope you'll go out and make today a great day. Be safe. Be blessed and join me right here again.